Hello. 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 What's up? My name is Jim Flannery, and welcome to the transcript. and welcome to The Transcript. This week, The Transcript looked in, looks into how being the lone minority in a classroom affects class dynamics, talks concussions with the girls' soccer team, explores addiction in the rap community, and follows Ben and Ned Bosco as they run for freshman class president. On Wednesday, Hurricane Florence weakens slightly to a Category 2 storm as it continues to make its way to the Carolinas. The storm has sustained winds up to 110 miles per hour and heavy rains, which could cause severe wind damage and catastrophic flooding. Authorities have asked for the 1.7 million individuals in threatened areas to evacuate inland. North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper warned of potentially historic and life-threatening devastation. This storm is a monster, he said. It's big and it's vicious. President Trump falsely declared via Twitter on Thursday that 3,000 people did not die when Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico last year. A government report last month found that 2,975 people died on an island as a result of the storm. Trump tweeted that when he left Puerto Rico after an October visit, there had anywhere from 6 to 18 deaths, and he claimed that Democrats were working to report higher death tolls to make him look as bad as possible. On Wednesday, Apple released three new iPhones and a new Apple smartwatch at an event hosted at the Steve Jobs Theater. The new watch features FDA-approved health capabilities. Also released was the iPhone XS with a 5.5-inch edge-to-edge screen and the iPhone XS Max, which featured a 6.5-inch screen, the biggest to be featured on an iPhone. Both phones have enhanced Face ID and improved processing systems. There's also a lower-grade iPhone XR made of brightly colored aluminum. The XS starts at $999, the XS Max at $1,099, and the XR at $749. Hi, I'm Amelia Tamayo. This week, an anonymous White House administration official wrote an op-ed to the New York Times alleging an internal resistance to Trump's White House. Ouch. In other news... Feeling alone is never fun. When a student finds themselves within the demographic minority of the classroom, this feeling can become a daily occurrence. We sat down with teachers and students to get some insight on how one might be affected by being a minority in the classroom setting. Yeah, I mean, it's something kind of unspoken, but when there's people around you who, at least for me, maybe it's kind of a challenge because mm -hmm. they've grown up together, uh, I think it can make it harder to work in group presentations and things like that. You know, sometimes I hear from my teachers, for example, oh, you speak uh, English well, and then there's always that qualification uh, for an Asian. If, like, teachers could, like, just ask me where I'm coming from, it would, like, make me feel comfortable and just not, like, assume that I've been here for, like, my whole life and just, like, expect me to know things, especially in, like, my English classes. It's, like, pretty hard for me to, like, write an essay or, like, write a paper or, like, something like that because, like, I don't know, I started using English real well in like 2016 when I first got to the high school. If I had any advice for people in my shoes, I would just say that, you know, uh, no matter what you face, whether it's 
uh, jokes or whatever. Um, you know, there still are good people here. I mean, most people aren't like that. And I would just say, be confident. Um, you know, don't doubt yourself and just go with who you are. I would just say, like, just don't pay attention to, like, bad jokes or, like, racist stuff or, like, just, like, focus on what you want to do. Just keep moving forward. Keep, like, a positive, like, attitude, positive vibes, you know, and just keep grinding, you know. There have been a couple instances where I feel like I haven't been heard. Um, oftentimes, it's in smaller groups where there's no teacher kind of guiding the conversation. Um, oftentimes, maybe one of me or one of my female classmates would um, like give an idea or make a suggestion and it kind of just kind of get like pushed aside or not really thought about. And then perhaps if a more confident, louder male classmate made the same suggestion, um, they'd definitely handle it as if it was like valid. I also believe mansplaining is a huge <laughs> thing that happens everywhere, especially mm -hmm. in classrooms, maybe even especially in STEM classrooms, is if you come up with a, you know, a number or an idea, it might be shot down a lot easier if you are a girl by men, because they, I, know, I don't think they're doing it consciously, I mm -hmm. think it's their subconscious being like, oh, because they're a girl or because you know, I'm more powerful and smarter than them, this isn't, they're not right. I think that the way that we're going to fix this problem is just getting loud and powerful women in STEM. Um, if you have an idea, speak up, and if you know that you're right, don't let a man tell you you're not. Um, mm -hmm. So many times girls have had an answer that they're confident with, and then the minute a guy is like, oh, no, maybe it's this, they'll change their minds, and that is just, like, I've seen that so many times. I myself have done that so many times. Just, like, stick with it. Like, if you think you're right, then you probably are. <laughs> Yeah, I would say the most important thing for younger girls is just confidence. Like I wish in the past I would have had the guts to speak up for my opinions and I feel like I'm starting to do that because if you know if you have, you have a gut feeling you're probably right. I'm Amelia Tamayo, thanks for watching and a big birthday shout out to Mr. Harp. Bye! Hey Jason, pass the ball. I'm Nat Walton. Welcome to Hamped Up. Y'all ready for this? A recent study published by the University of Minnesota states that girls' soccer suffer more concussions than any other high school sport. Statistics show that roughly 28% of girls' soccer injuries are concussions, compared to 23% of boys' football injuries. I wanted to know how this affected Northampton girls' soccer. So I sat down with athletic director Kara Sheridan. It's not surprising. Um, often girls are less likely to do a traditional strength and conditioning program in the weight room. Um, and so that might uh, create um, a weakness just in overall body strength. Um, that might help avoid um, concussions. I think we have a better understanding of how um, the brain works and concussion testing and concussion protocol than we ever have before. Our numbers in our traditional contact sports have, um, have been reduced over time. The sport that has the most concussions at Northampton High School is Ultimate Frisbee. I'm also really cautious, especially around football and soccer and other programs, um, about just looking at one sport because I think concussions um, are prevalent across the board. And so rather than looking at sports, sports and how they're related to concussions, I would prefer to look at um, strength and conditioning, nutrition, overall, um, overall training programs as opposed to how one sport can improve that. Uh, their rates over another sport or, or something like that. I also discussed this report with Natalie and Bridget Golerslau, the captains of the team. I wanted to hear their thoughts and talk with them about their season. We've definitely had some concussions on our team. Um, I had a very minor one a few years ago. We had um, one of our teammates had a very severe concussion, so she was out playing for two years. Um, our goalkeeper, Sid White, got a pretty bad concussion my sophomore year and yeah we've had a few um, so I think it people have definitely been out from concussions yeah I think our success last year just makes us hungrier for more because 
we know that we can get that far and we just want to get farther and we want to win Western Mass. Both of us had been kind of natural leaders but being chosen captains we did have to take some more take on some more responsibilities so we over the summer we had to run some captains practices we ran a summer soccer league and we've been war doing warm-ups and things like that but yeah and we both have different types of leadership positions um, I currently can't play because I tore my ACL so I'm more of a coach while Bridget is really that like on-field leader girls soccer is oh one and one and they have a game at six versus Chicopee boys soccer is one two and one and today they have a game at four at Renaissance. Both boys and girls cross country are one and zero, oh, and their next meet is on Tuesday. Golf and field hockey are one and zero, oh, and field hockey plays a game tonight at 7:30 in Agawam. And uh, football is also one and zero, oh, and they play tonight at Smithvoke at seven. I'm Nat Walton. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Gabe. And I'm Gigi. Welcome, Welcome to, to In Tune. Tune, where music and entertainment meet the politics of a suburban high school. On Friday, September 7th, rapper and producer Mac Miller tragically passed away at age 26 due to a drug overdose. His passing is the latest in a string of drug-related deaths in the rap community. Miller was loved and admired by fans and fellow artists. His death opens up a conversation about the stigma behind addiction and mental health. And then it's like, then you get bored. Then you're like, well, I could just be high and I could have a whole adventure in this room. I'm always We like, were curious to hear what students yeah. thought about the promotion of drug use in the rap industry. So we took to the halls of NHS to ask their opinions. A lot of the lyrics in rap songs definitely talk about like using drugs. And I think that that definitely has an influence on the listeners because they kind of look up and idolize these rappers that um, sometimes, uh, I guess, use drugs in a dangerous way. I did half a zen, 13 hours till I land, had me out like a light. Um, so I think that it definitely has a large effect on its listeners and viewers. With Mac Miller's death, I think it just goes to show that folks like struggle with addiction from all walks of life. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. This is an issue that is affecting everybody, regardless of who's promoting it or who isn't. This week, we sat down with Dr. Peter Cassis to discuss the prevalence of addiction in our society and what can lead to recovery. Uh, stigma is one of the greatest barriers uh, uh, that people face in, uh, in getting assistance for their addiction disorder. The good news is that uh, there's more and greater and greater recognition that, um, that substance abuse is not a personal defect, <laughs> that it's not, um, it's not a character flaw. It's not just a connection between addiction and mental health. Addiction is mental health. They're synonymous, they're one and the same. Um, many people will consider addiction to be some kind of moral failing. However, that's not really a, a helpful way to think about it. Uh, instead, it's important to think about addiction as a disease. It is important to spread awareness about mental health issues in our community. If you are concerned that someone may be struggling, there are many ways you can reach out and ask for help. What's the agenda for today? You ready? Hey, oh, welcome to the other stuff. As you may know, freshman elections are happening next Tuesday. These elected student officials have a lot of authority in their class and in the school system. They're also in charge of Booster Week in October and get to design the class float. Now Ben and I have been running for class president every year since we were freshmen and we have, we have never, never won. won. So we figured this being the last election while we're at the high school, 
we would make sure that we win, even if it means bending the rules. Wait, Ben, aren't freshman elections only for freshmen? Hmm, I think you're right. I guess we'll have to finesse the system. Indeed, we will. What's the first step in any election? Getting your name on the ballot. Next, we need to advertise our campaign. Ben? I don't think that'll be enough. We can't win with just flyers. You might be right. I think we need to take this one step further. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? We need access to those election results. Thanks for watching. Special thanks Jim Flannery. His show is tomorrow at Lilly Library. Student Union meets every second and fourth Wednesday of every month at 6.30 in the library. Don't forget freshman elections are next Tuesday. All meetings are open and we would love to have you.